Senator Patricia Torres Ray is a member of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus. I spoke with her about what her district needs and the changes she'd like to see. You represent the area of Minneapolis that was heavily impacted by the looting that occurred following the death of George Floyd. What are you hearing from your constituents and what do they need? I'm hearing two things. One is that they really want us to address systemic issues and address police reform. The issue around criminal justice reform really is a top priority for my district. But they also want us to work in reconstruction and really looking at what it is that we need to do in order to rebuild our communities, rebuild our businesses, um, provide, provide the necessary resources to create an economy that works for all of us because the civil unrest was the result of an economy that didn't work for a vast group of people. So I think that uh, my district is very clear on those two issues and they want us to pay very close attention to the future in terms of providing you know, the safety nets that are necessary, not just in terms of you know, security and safety, but also prosperity uh, for all communities and looking at how do we prevent gentrification you know, the expansion of uh, large businesses that are not um, owned by people from the community. And so those are really the two most important messages that my constituents are trying to deliver to the legislature and to the community in general. So you recently spoke before a joint meeting of the Transportation Committee and the Judiciary Committee. They're or the Judiciary Committee. They are looking into the lawlessness that followed George Floyd's death. You read a list of names of people who've been arrested for looting and for arson, and that list, the, the people represented by the, on that list are not from the Twin Cities, they're from greater Minnesota and even from out of state. Is there any way to prevent those opportunists, essentially, who, who are coming in to the area of civil unrest and, and creating more chaos, is there any way to prevent that from happening in the future? Absolutely. I think I talk about this issue really early um, during this crisis that uh, I noticed that some of the people that came to the city were people that I, that I didn't recognize. And the reason I was able to do that is because I have worked with activists very, very closely. Um, they come to my office, I know their names, I know their faces, we recognize each other in the streets. I don't believe that that is the case for an overwhelming majority of elected officials. They don't know who our activists are. They don't know about their work. So it's difficult to think in terms of how do we protect activists? How do we protect this very important process that really strengthens this incredible democracy and this wonderful country that we live in if we don't know who they are, if we don't know, you know what, what they are trying to propose, if we don't have a relationship with them? So I think that is the first and most important step that we need to develop those relationships. Then we're able to recognize, you know, who's doing the real work? How do we respond? How do we have meaningful interactions, meaningful connections, and hear their message? The reason this happened in the streets at the level that it happened is because we have not been able to have meaningful interactions with activists, get to know each other, get to work together, and so therefore, they get to the streets to demand this attention, to demand this conversation, and then we don't recognize, you know, who is there, who isn't, what are we trying to do? We, have, we really need to do a better job of connecting with our activists, meaningfully developing relationships that, so that we can do policy, because that's the job of the activists, actually, is to influence you know, our, our decision-making process, and we should be welcoming, you know, the, the activists, we should be really listening, and we can prevent all of this if we did that. It's just that simple, just that simple in my view. I think uh, George Floyd's death uh, prompted many of us to take a closer look at systemic racism in Minnesota, and there may be misunderstandings about the differences between interpersonal racism, you know, one person behaving badly, and the structure of, of systemic racism, which is much broader. How would you describe the systemic racism faced by people of color and indigenous people? I believe that these two issues are uh, connected. 
you cannot have a system functioning with people who make decisions, with people who, with people who act every day, whose job is to protect people, to interact with people, to make decisions, and then have a system that is in a vacuum outside of these, uh, you know, this um, direction or, or this um, uh, personal management, let's call it that way, right? So they go together. And so I believe that it is very important that we understand that systems are managed by people. People make, you know, these systems happen, behave, interact, and therefore they are connected. What has happened, I think, over the years in this country is that we have taken for granted that some changes and some systemic, um, you know, um, protections were in place for everyone, and we assume that everybody benefit from those systemic protections. And what we find in Minnesota is that those systemic protections, services, and benefits are really not available to an overwhelming number of people of color and indigenous people. So we have to work in our own personal attitudes and understanding of what that is so that we can do our jobs and really improve the systems that were put in place to protect everyone in the state of Minnesota. So I hope that we are able to understand that and we're able to um, really reflect on the fact that Minnesota has had some of the deepest disparities in this country. And for as long as I've been in this country, which is now 33 years, we've been talking about it and we have made very little progress to really change that. So then are you optimistic that this tragic incident maybe a catalyst for significant change and what might that change look like i am optimistic um, i am optimistic because i see a lot of engagement from young communities from our youth and that gives me tremendous optimism i am a parent of a 22 and a 24 year old and when i hear them talk about their friends and how diverse their communities are and the level of engagement and knowledge about what is going on in this country and their fearless attitude towards change and, and really working on this, I get a lot of hope. And I just feel that it is that energy, that connectivity that exists in our youth that is gonna take us really to, to the change that we need right now because I don't believe that we have done really the job that we needed to do as a generation you know for some of us who i mean my 50s people know that you know we were kind of taught to be more obedient and say well you know this cannot be done so move along and i think this generation is just not accepting that and saying you know what we're not going to move along because these disparities have gone so far that they are not just impacting those very communities they are impacting all of us and so it's time for change and they are you know um they are ready. They are ready. And I am very hopeful, very optimistic that they are going to help us move into this uh, society that uh, builds the equity that we need for everyone. Senator Patricia Torres-Ray, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.